There we go. There we go. We recorded. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so my name is Divya. I'm the Community Engagement Manager for uh, uh, Twatch's Tiny Forest Program. And we are joined by the amazing Sophie. So if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. So and I've been introduced by the amazing Divya, who is fabulous and does an amazing job. We work closely together in the Tiny Forest team. Um, I'm Sophie Cowling. I'm a research manager in the Tiny Forest uh, science team. So Tiny Forest has a number of different teams that kind of look after um, the planting, organisation and monitoring of Tiny Forest. So I'm in the science team and then Divya uh, looks after our community uh, engagement side of things. So yeah, thanks for joining us today. Yay. Um, do we crack on? We have 12 people. I think that's a good starting point, I would think. Sure. So thanks for joining us today. Um, this is a bit of an unusual, a lot of our tiny forest presentations are often around very specific to the tiny forest and, and either training our tree keepers um, to monitor different things or to maintain their forest. This is a bit of an unusual one that I've kind of thrown in there because it's very seasonal. So it's really mushroom season mushrooms are around all the year but autumn autumn in the uk is very synonymous with mushrooms and fungi um and actually recently this at uh, this uh this week correlates with uk fungus day which is at the weekend so fungus is a slightly off-putting term but you know it's the better term for mushrooms so we thought it would be quite and because uh they're often very closely associated with woodlands and we will be over time starting to see some mushrooms in our tiny forest and we have had questions about mushrooms in our tiny forest i thought we'd give a little bit more of like a science webinar rather um it will link back to the tiny forest at the end but overall we're i'm just going to discuss and introduce uh a very general overview around um uh, fungi in forests and fungi in general give you an introduction to fungi and look at fungi in forests. I've changed this title to Fantastic Fungi in Forests because there is actually a film called Fantastic Fungi, which I think is free. I think it's on Netflix. So if anybody wants to go and have a look, there's a film called Fantastic Fungi. It does focus quite heavily on psychedelic mushrooms, though. <laughs> <laughs> So excuse my location, I'm having internet issues, so I'm, I'm presenting this from my van. <laughs> So if you want, Divya is in control. So sometimes I'll be like, next slide. Yeah, and I'll struggle to do that. And yeah, there we go. There we go. So I just get, thought I'd give a quick overview of what we're covering today. Um, it's going to be very whistle stop tour around sort of general introduction to fungi and fungi in forests and some of the principles that you might have heard of, such as the wood wide web. So today I'll be discussing the evolution of fungi um, because that's not super in depth but it's just quite interesting some things that people might not know what really classes as a fungi um why are they really important in our world because they're actually integral um what ecological role do they play within forests linking it back to forest and tiny forest um what can you expect to see in kind of probably more mature tiny forests not tiny forests but mature, mature older forests at this time of year what are we doing in the Tiny Forest programme around mushrooms? What future visions do we have? Uh, and then where you can learn more. So if you, a lot of people now, I think m fungi and mushrooms in general are starting to gain um, sort of traction and publicity and also interest in the public eye. And a lot of people don't know how or where to go to learn more. So we'll add that. And just a disclaimer, I am not a mycologist, which is a mushroom or fungi expert. I have a keen interest in them and would like to learn more, but I'm a plant scientist by expertise. So, and just there, the fungi that you've got down on the right hand side are all ones that you can see in woodlands. Um, the top you've got uh, fly agaric or also known as toadstools, don't eat them. Um, second one down is, uh, this is cauliflower fungus. You won't find it at this time of year. It's, it happens much earlier in the season. That is edible and it's very tasty. Uh, again, do not eat anything based on my recommendations. If you want to eat mushrooms and learn how to forage, meet an expert. Uh, and at the bottom, we've got this beautiful yellow staghorn fungus, which you will see in some woodlands around this time of year. They're gorgeous. So on to the next slide, Divya. 
So just to clarify, this is why I'm introducing the evolution of fungi. They are not plants. <laughs> they are actually more closely related to us as humans than plants are, than they, and they are to plants. So on the left, you can see what's known as a phylogenetic tree. Um, you, if you just pay attention to the green, the red, and then the big blue is fungi. So the green you can see is uh, green plants. So this is our trees in our tiny forests and our grass and all those lovely things, generally, you know, plants that photosynthesize. Then it kind of, so all these trees, of, it shows how closely genetically related organisms are. So then it goes down to a branch that shows where we have animals on one branch, which we're part of. And then the other branch that this is showing specifically here is fungi. Um, so these are different, what's called clades, they're different groups of fungal groups. This is just to demonstrate the fact that actually we are, fungi are more closely related to us than they are to green plants. Um, and this is partly because in the cell wall, they have a substance called chitin and you find chitin in, in um, animals. So for example, the exoskeletons of insects, the beaks of squids, um, this is something that is present in, in the animal kingdom. Part of the reason that I as a vegetarian don't like the taste of fungi because to me, they taste really meaty. So that's, but it's also part of the reason that some people love them. <laughs> So fungi actually are, are super and they were really integral to the evolution of life on the planet as we know it. So they were one of the first living organisms. They evolved around 800, apart from like single, single cellular amoebas, they were one of the first kind of complex living organisms. And they evolved around 800 million years ago. Difficult to date exactly because you're based on the fossil record, but there's been fossil records showing fungi that are present from about 710 to 850 million years ago because they were really integral and for try for starting to free up minerals and mobilize minerals from rocks for example and they really started the process of nutrients and minerals being available to living organisms so they were really integral and they at one point in history they were huge they were eight meter tall mushrooms can you imagine yes <laughs> Yeah, eight meters tall mushrooms. And they're really important for decomposition. So before mushroom or poor fungi existed, because they're just fantastic decomposers, actually, if there was nothing to decompose organic things dying, it just piled up. And that apparently was a thing in history. It's just actually dead matter just piling up until things evolved to decompose it. So they evolved 600 million years before plants, um, way before plants. And actually, plants couldn't have evolved without fungi. Fungi, when plants first came out of oceans as um, algae, or, or what's also known as cyanobacteria, so um, that bacteria that could photosynthesize, they didn't have roots. So actually, fungi acted as plants, as roots for plants, because they were able to mobilize nutrients and minerals from rocks, from soil, and then may have a mutual relationship with these kind of photosynthesizing organisms. Over time, plants evolved their own roots. Um, they're actually better to some extent than than uh, fungi roots, but they really couldn't. Plants couldn't have evolved without uh, fungi, and part of that reason is actually phosphorus is really integral for um, plant growth. You know, we put it in plant food, essential for plant growth, and fungi were essentially responsible for providing all of the fungi to early land plants. So without Without fungi, land plants wouldn't have been able to evolve and we wouldn't have had uh, massive changes in environment. So in the Devonian period, we had a drop of 80% of carbon dioxide in the air. It caused mass extinction events. That was due to the evolution of plants. Um, but without, without fungi, that never would have happened. We wouldn't have evolved. So, and they're also environmental superstars. So they've changed environments, but we really don't appreciate them because they're kind of under our feet and we can't see them. Onto the next slide, Divya. So, what are fungi? So, as I said, they're not just mushrooms. So, mushrooms is actually a fruiting body of a fungi. So, they really range. So, yeast is actually a fungi. So, you get your brewer's yeast, um, penicillin. So, the mold. So, mold yeast. Um, they're all they're fungi technically. They're kind of single cellular. Um, so they go from being really tiny microscopic, such as uh, penicillin mold that helps create antibiotics, 
to these like single cellular yeasts, which is what you can see on the top image, to then these really kind of complex, large organisms such as mushrooms. So on the bottom, you can see some mushrooms starting to sprout. Um, and the cell on, it, like I say, what's different in fungi compared to plants is, is and why we're closely related is they can tell, contain this substance called chitin, which we find in animals. Mushrooms are what's known as heterotrophs. That's basically a fancy word for they can't make their own food. So plants can make their own food. They eat sunlight and they make their own food. OK, uh, mushrooms and us, we can't make our own food. We have to get it elsewhere. So mushrooms will break down things in the forest, for example. So in our tiny forest, uh, fungi will break down leaves and, tr and branches, etc. And they, that forms their food little bit of feeding on so in terms of the structure if you imagine a mushroom that you see in the forest um it basically that forms it's a fruiting body it's a sporing body so that's like so when so imagine a flower a flower happens because a plant's wanting to create seeds that's essentially what a mushroom is it's like a fungal flower okay so what you what is the actual main body of a fungi in a in a multicellular one that we're thinking about like in mushrooms is actually this amazing white network known as a mycelium so if the bottom right picture you can see all these white threads um lots of those together is known as mycelium individually they're called hyphal threads so if you have a look at this picture in front of you you've got this complex structure of a mushroom that's the sporing body that's going to disperse spores but under the ground you've got this network of white mycelium that's actually made of these really tiny really thin thread-like structures called hypha okay so then when you're talking about the wood wide web that is what we're talking about we're talking about this web of mycelium that lays underneath the ground and it's actually uh, the largest organism on Earth is actually a fungal fungi. So in Oregon, the largest fung largest organism in the world is a fungi in Oregon that's four square miles. It's a honey fungus. So it's huge. And they actually contribute like a huge amount in the soil. So 50 percent of the living mass of soil is mycelium. And if you stretched all the hyphae, so these little threads on Earth end to end, it was is approximated to be half the width of our galaxy. Oh, so wow. it's yeah, so it's a really, really big and it's all under our feet and we don't see it. And it's this living network. Um, you might have heard of lichens. So lichens are actually an interesting symbiosis of just to throw it out there. You've got this weird thing called lichens that we see on trees, and that's actually a symbiosis of fungi and algae living together and they create these weird wonderful structures on trees okay so fungi are so it give you there's some like little pictures that will go for a click with each point as you go through so fungi are super important for so many reasons that we really don't appreciate so they are so they're integral to our food systems not only for like for example eating mushrooms but the fermentation of so many things like fermentation of soy sauce Corn is made by a type of um, yeast, brewing of beer, making of cheese with molds, you know, really, you know, important for food. Um, they're really integral for medicine. So, as I said, uh, penicillin is actually comes from a fungal mold. So uh, the cephalosporin antibiotics, that's like a global industry of like nearly 15 billion per annum. But also the use of fungi in uh, as a supplement is becoming increasingly um, common. So on the right, I actually take these supplements. Um, there's a lot of research now going into the use of fungi as like, for example, anti-cancer medications of, or being really important for mental health. So there's a whole industry around that. Um, fungi is super important for scientific research. They're actually a really important model organism, yeast especially. Uh, a lot of really key genes in humans have been discovered um, by equivalents that have been found in yeast and then we've been able to work on yeast and they use it as a gene discovery mechanism um, we also use mushrooms for structural materials so they've actually now made a living concrete called microcrete that's um that's going to hopefully be it's in early stages but they're hoping it's going to be a more sustainable material building material that will kind of challenge concrete 
And then there's other things like, so for vegans out there, mushrooms can be used to make mushroom leather to produce in those bags, coats, all sorts of things you can buy that are made of mushroom uh, material. And why we're here today really is the fact that mushrooms are incredibly important for the environment and the ecosystem function. So that what you can see on the right here, the green blobs are actually trees. And then in, in, in quite a small area, so this is, this is from research done in Canada, and the green blobs are um, Douglas fir trees and all those colored connections are different, my, uh, the different fungal networks connecting all the trees and the different colors relate to different species of fungi. So they're incredibly interconnected. And I know the association between a fungi and a plant root is known as mycorrhiza. So mica being mushroom, rhiza being root. So literally fun like mushroom root, you know. And so mycorrhizal associations are apparent of they've estimated that plants who have associations with fungi store three times more carbon from the atmosphere. So they're really important for sort of climate change, ecosystem function, all these things. So they have fungi, super important. We massively underestimate them. So next we'll discuss uh, the role of fungi in forests. So um, just a term that you might see banded around is saprophytic. Again, another fancy word to basically mean that there is fungi, a type of fungi that live on or eat dead or decaying organic matter. So they, these are the types of fungi that you tend to see in forests because they'll eat all that, that sort of vegetation that falls on the floor, dead organisms and their that that their role is really important for sort of how the forest functions and they create really intricate mycelial networks that help towards supporting the health and ecosystem of the forest and that's the case with tiny forests so they're super integral to forest health and overall ecosystem function so the role of fungi in forests so so as i said they are decomposers of organic matter so we haven't got these things piling up um they're really important for nutrient uh, uptake like helping plants um facilitate nutrient uptake so because fungi break down these dead organisms those nutrients go into the soil as a result of the fungi breaking it down which it wouldn't otherwise um and fungi also are really integral for helping plants to like anticipate attacks of um you know various parasites or disease on the flip side though there's always it's not all nice and shiny in forests these things there's a good and a, a, a bad side you know fungi actually are responsible for some really big diseases so dutch elm disease is due to a fungi okay so ash um you might... as well. pardon ash die back as well i think was... I think, yeah, and ash die back. And then you get rust, which is like a fungal disease that affects rice and could cause massive yield loss. So it's six, one, half a dozen, the other. It's not all happy times. I think people like to think that fungi are this amazing, wonderful organism. And they, they are. They, there's the dark side. <laughs> but then for, similarly, you know, there are some fungi that will attack and feed off trees, um, including types of mushroom, which I'll come to one of those in a bit. But similarly, this, this mycelial network that lays under the soil that connects to plant roots, they can shuttle warning signals between trees that will alert a nearby tree, hey, you need to activate your immune response because bad things are happening. So, you know, so there's this conversation that's going on and it helps to kind of protect, um, but also attack, <laughs> you know, trees within forests. Uh, as I said, I fungi are really integral for sort of breaking breaking down nutrients but they're also integral to sort of how basically nutrients and carbon moves and changes in the soil so there's some very complex processes that i won't go into right now that happens within soils around how carbon and nutrients such as nitrogen are moved around in soils and that really affects both ecosystem function but actually global climate um and they help help sort of through these processes they are really are underpinning improving soil quality um so breaking things down basically creates soil so a nutrient rich soil um so it improves soil quality it helps break soil up and create poor, poor air space in soil which is really important for plant root growth 
Um, it provides food opportunities for animals and also just generally helps to improve biodiversity. Um, so that having all these things just feeds into a healthy system that works well. And as I've mentioned already, um, fungi are really important for the drawdown of carbons, carbon from the atmosphere and that contributes towards climate change. Partly through helping, they do this through helping trees grow bigger so that that releasing around nutrients and feeding trees nutrients that's one reason why so that when i said about trees that have mycorrhizal associations so they're trees that are linked to the fungi they basically grow three times bigger you know so they draw down three times as much carbon um and also the fungi themselves act as a carbon sink because they're a living body and their living body is made of carbon so the bigger they grow the more carbon they store so they're actually, um, you know, they're really important for climate change. And there's lots of science research going in. People starting to recognise how important fungi are for uh, carbon drawdown and climate change, but also carbon release from soil. So they're really important. Um, and this isn't just, you know, in natural forests. This is happening everywhere all around us. So it's it's not just in these big forests. I think, sorry, on that previous slide, Livia, there's this lovely image on the right that's kind of like quite an urban park, but everything you see around you have that. And most plants, 90% of plant species, have some kind of relationship under the ground with the fungal species. So it's all, all this life happening beneath our feet everywhere. Yep, so I think you've probably heard of the term the wood wide web. Uh, this is also known as um, it's essentially a mycelial network. So the, these kind of white uh, kind of threads that is the living fungal body under the ground is a mycelial network. Um, and that creates this principle that you probably heard, heard recently known as the wood wide web, which is just a way of trees connecting to each other. You will have heard some sort of what's known as anthropomorphizing it so kind of saying oh you have a mother tree that's feeding its babies and and it's true you know there is this research that shows bigger older trees will kind of uh provide resources to younger sickly trees around it and that that happens through the facilitation of these these fungal networks so you can see in this image here you've got for it's very simplified but it's basically two trees and there you can see that these green interactions from an ecto, what's called an ecto mycorrhizal fungus, is just a name of a type of kind of fungus. Uh, ecto means like inside, so that it basically it's a it's a fungus that kind of goes inside the plant roots with its with its hyphae, so they actually integrate inside the cells. Um, and you can see here that that connection through the ectomycorrhizal fungus is basically a facilitator, facilitates the movement of minerals and carbon between two different trees. It can also facilitate, there's also a little bit of fighting sometimes, so sometimes it won't get so much, there'll be an uneven allocation of resources, but there has been shown that you know, some some trees that are really desperate in need of phosphorus, if there's a surplus on one side, it'll get moved to a nearby tree that needs it. You know, and the same if there's a stress response because a tree has had an attack by a, a, a really aggressive insect, it will send a stress response through its roots, which is then signaled through these mycelial networks to other trees nearby. And then they'll prepare themselves for an attack and they can protect themselves better. So there's this kind of base, basically like a society, you know, we kind of we all play a different role within society. We all communicate with each other. And when you have these diverse societies that are very interconnected, it just works better. And it's essentially the same within forests. Obviously, there's, you know, there's going to be baddies and goodies, um, but that's the principle. And so, Divya, if you can just... Yeah. So I think it's kind of hard sometimes to visualize like how that happens. So this is just a, ignore all the kind of sciencey names and just like look at the picture. So this orange thing is like a root tip. And sometimes it can be hard to visualize like, oh, how do they send nutrients? How do they send these messages? How do they talk to the trees? And this is what a root tip looks like. So uh, this one on the left is one type that it does it and it goes kind of goes inside the root and then it follows the edges of the cell walls inside the root around and that's how it kind of communicates so that's called an arbuscule mycorrhizal and on the right you've got the ecto 
and that's what i'm saying about inside so they put their hyphae and they literally go inside the cells you know but it's not it's not damaging it's a facilitate well sometimes it is you know but but it's a way of literally interconnecting with the roots of the trees and other plants so just to see in case you wanted to see what that looks like so it's a very quick overview of the wood wide web so, so I thought it'd be quite fun to see what some common forest fungi are that you might see out and about at this time of year. These are some of my favourite ones. You're more likely to see these in like mature, older woodlands. So like um, broadleaf woodlands that might have like oaks and beeches and all sorts of lovely broadleaf trees. Um, and also some old pine forests. So this is an amethyst deceiver, really beautiful, bright purple, quite small, sort of this big, can eat them. Again, not telling, don't, you know, they are edible, but see see an expert first. <laughs> They're really tasty. Um, next, you have uh, sulfur tuft, not edible. Um, you will, These are really common. You might actually end up seeing these in tiny forests or even on the benches in tiny forests. If some of the tiny forests are quite old, um, or a bit older where they're starting to be there you often see them on fallen logs um in the, these these kind of tufts of sort of orange co covered little mushrooms and they're known as sulfur tufts um next we've got jelly ear i think everybody will have seen these so like amethyst deceiver is a little bit special i always feel special when i find one um but jelly ear are these kind of like little gelatinous ears that are on you'll see them on branches often in really damp areas they're actually edible um that i've eaten them before they're not they're not super tasty but but they're quite gelatinous but yeah they technically are and they're very common um next specialist for this time of year is the winter chanterelle which i've misspelt um they are a chanterelle they are edible again um again go on a specialist foraging course they are they're not as beautiful as the summer chanterelles that you get that are like bright orange but again a very lovely very obvious trumpeted shaped mushroom so i've seen this woodland that i'm looking at now there's lots in there right now i, I picked some last week and next we have honey fungus. So this is the one that I was saying is the biggest organism in the world. So it's quite voracious. Um, we actually have had some tree keepers sending us inquiries about honey fungus because they've been started growing on some of the benches in tiny forests. If you see any and you know what it is, I actually would like to know because they're actually parasitic and they kill trees. So it's, yeah, so they kind of predate on trees. So you often you'll see them on wet benches, wet trees. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're very voracious. And then they're the kind of bad guys of the, the woodland world. <laughs> and they, little fun fact about honey fungus, they actually kind of glow. Like it's really unusual you see it, but there's, there's tales of World War II fighters flying over forests and seeing these ethereal glows in woodlands and it's actually honey fungus they can sometimes give off this kind of blue ethereal glow in really like dark conditions and um, i can't remember exactly what causes it but it's very cool and fi finally really classic that everybody's gonna like kind of it's in fairy tale books that is everywhere at the moment in sort of certain areas especially pine forests you see in a lot but sometimes you'll see them in grasslands is the fly agaric this is a psychedelic mushroom that i would never recommend to anybody that you consume um so yeah but it's a very beautiful uh iconic fairy tale mushroom it's wonderful it gets really big you want to get the size of my face in some areas so these are some common ones for this time of year and finally relating this back to monitoring mushrooms in our tiny forest we're not doing anything specifically at the moment i think we would like to in time um because miyawaki style forest which is what a tiny forest is it's this miyawaki planting method that's planted very densely and has got a deep soil preparation with diverse native trees there's no research on the role of mycelial networks and how they work and what kind of mushrooms you expect to see in these kind of miyawaki forests so i think it would be a really fantastic research area that i'd like to kind of get going we do have uh a research project with an academic from derby he's not a mycologist exactly but he has a theory that um mycelial networks don't grow as well in tiny forests compared to sort of because we're doing all this soil digging and we're affecting that um 
which is super interesting, especially considering the trees grow so well, which is what you tend to see. You tend to see really good tree growth when um, you've got good mycelial networks. So I think in tiny forests, it'd be great if we got a research opportunity um, to see how mycelial networks grow as tiny forests grow. And part of that is monitoring the mushrooms. So I will, will be something we have spoken about it. And we, uh, so my kind of recommendation is if you have an interest in fungi or you're excited about them and you want to learn more and you're a tree keeper, um, please do keep a journal of the type of mushrooms that you see, ideally with photos, so we can double check the species um, and the approximate time of year that you see them as, as the tiny forests are growing. So because we can kind of then start to get an idea of what are the most common species that we're seeing and what what phase of the tiny forest growth are these starting to pop up, because it will take a little bit of time for these mycelial networks to develop underground. Um, before the fruiting bodies which is the mushrooms pop up so we do know that people are starting to see mushrooms we've had some photos Divi has had those before um, so if you do feel like doing that that'd be amazing and then please share your journal with the tiny forest team so with myself and with Divya and also as I said before if you see a fungi that could be damaging to the forest such as parasitic fungi like honey fungus like please tell us if it's in the forest, there's not probably a lot we can do about it. But the tree keeper that did contact us recently, it was on a bench. So we could uh, potentially look at getting that bench removed because it, these ones can spread to other parts of the forest. And obviously that can long term cause them. Um, it never gets bad enough that it would, for example, decimate a forest, but you'd certainly get some mortality and some things would die. Mm. So it's just understanding more about how a tiny forest um grow with mushrooms over time so if you want to get involved let us know okay and finally just in case you want to learn more because I've, I've spoken to a lot of people over the years who's gone oh, I'm really interested in mushrooms but I don't know how where to start because obviously people are, especially for foraging people are scared of them because they they can really injure you or kill you if you eat the wrong one so that's why I'm like if you're interested in foraging for mushrooms as food please look for local foraging courses. There will be lots of them. I went on one last year. It was wonderful. Um, great day out. So, but if you want to learn more about mushrooms in general, so I love mushrooms as a um, part of understanding ecosystems because they're so important. The British Mycological Society is a great place to start. Sounds very serious, but they're friendly from anything from complete beginners all the way up to like proper scientific experts so and they're very very keen because mycologists and mushrooms um keen mushroom amateurs are quite unusual so as i said at the start of this presentation uh, it's actually uk fungus day on the 7th of october and if you're interested and you're not doing anything on sunday the 8th of october there's actually an international symposium online um it's free so and it's in different sections so if you go on eventbrite it's it's on there um and yeah there's a, a kind of uk fungus day uh website as well so if you just google that but the british mycological society uh, is a great place to start i think the membership is only 30 pounds a year or something like that and there's lots of events so they have lots of talks etc and um, newsletters and things so other ways to learn are of course through books it's fantastic wave look in fact here's my my dog-eared copy of entangled life so with various bits noting um so i would recommend entangled life by merlin sheldrake he is a mycologist researcher but he just is like his i think he comes from a very artistic family because his brother's a musician um amazing musician who's kind of specializes with like nature sounds but he's the way he writes is really engaging it's accessible he does his own drawings using the ink from fun fungi in the book he's it's a fantastic read you will be wowed uh, and if you want to look at id then um, mushroom id books this one by roger phillips is a classic that everybody uses co uh, called mushrooms and it's also beautiful it's got lovely pictures and then this one i've put right in the middle is a little just a little field id guide that's quite nice to take out with you so there there are a few real good ones to get you started and then finally, uh, if you're really keen on actually kind of like either looking at formal certification or just taking some courses, the Field Studies Council, which is the formal uh, body that looks after ecological 
training and certification and um, they have formal courses uh, so you, you can either just do it it's beginner friendly and you enjoy it so there's some online courses or there's some formal certification those in-person classes so these are for example on the right these are some ones they've got going at the moment so fungal identification autumn fungi fungi online and then there's some more complex ones so these are if you're interested in fungi these are some really easy accessible ways to get you started that will mean you'll be an expert in no time <laughs> brilliant so that's it um i hope that was informative i hope i didn't go too in depth i'm sorry because i am a keen mushroom person uh i hope you learn some things um and can take that back to both the, the older forests around you, but also we're starting to think around how tiny forests are growing and thriving when you're there. So let us know if anybody has got any comments or also if anybody has any questions. I was that, I was that good, no questions. <laughs> Amazing, very interesting to hear all about it. Thank you. Um, so yeah, please feel free to unmute yourself and throw in questions that you have. I have noted down a couple, so maybe. On, I can't promise I'll be able to answer them. I'll try. Yeah, yeah I was wondering, so I was thinking about the fungal network uh, yeah. between the trees and uh, like, because these are all underground, I was just curious of how they study it because you I don't think it is as extractive, so you don't like dig up soil and go underneath. So just curious of how they do it. it. It's really hard. They do a lot of things in the lab. So I mm. don't actually know. I can't remember exactly how they do it in the forests. I can I can send it. I can actually put a couple of papers on here. But if you Google sort of yeah. um, research with wide web, um, I can't remember exactly how they do it. I think they do a lot of modeling. But it's mm -hmm. certainly in the lab of like understand it's actually one of the, you're right anything that's to do with below ground is soil because this is studying plants roots is really hard for this reason as well but they do a lot of experiments in the lab so they'll put mm -hmm. them on these um substrates that are clear with lots of nutrients yeah. in them um so they kind of give them the the networks everything they need and they'll try and simulate um so they'll do experiments where they'll have pots you know plants in pots and then they'll kind of inoculate one pot with the type of mycelium and then one pot not and right. they can do things over time where they can obviously track because you can use um with the movement of so you can have these clear substrates where you can actually see how they grow but one of the ways they see the movement of nutrients or immune response chemicals in these experiments is they'll use isotope labeling oh, yeah so, so it, yeah. yeah and they can follow yeah. it over to uh, see whether it ends up in um they'll see a uh, piece of yes of recording is available um so the isotope label for example uh the mycelium or a nutrient that's put in the soil and then they see whether it ends up inside the plant and if it's ended up inside the plant then it's been moved there through the uh, mycelium so but yeah it's, it's very complex anything in soil is really hard to do but I'm sorry I wasn't able to answer the question about the, the modelling of the actual wood-wide networks. I can't remember off the top of my head how they did it. No, 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 no. This is interesting. I mean, yeah, uh, like, yeah, I would imagine that you can kind of extrapolate it too. Um, yeah, they usually do it in quite small plots. So that one I showed at the Douglas Fair, it's quite a small plot. And mm -hmm. I think I think they might do it where they take soil cores because they can see in a soil core in different places whether obviously it's got mycelium in it or not. And... Um, yeah, but I think a lot of it is often through, even in the field, they can do the isotope labelling because it's not toxic. So, yeah. That being the... No, no reason. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we will be recording this and uh, we will be uploading it on the Earthwatch YouTube channel. So we have a playlist called Tree Keeper Playlist. So that's where all our training recordings are put up. So you can always have a look at Earthwatch on YouTube and then find the playlist. Um, any other questions? Um, I see a lot of new faces. I'm just guessing a lot of you are, are you guys familiar with uh, Tiny Forest? Because I see a couple of tree keepers, but I do see quite a few new faces as well. So 
they might have just hooked people in on Eventbrite from uh, the fun guy I... sort of things, which is great. So yeah, so for those, those of you who aren't, uh, who've come just for the fun guy and don't know anything about our organisation, Earthwatch Europe is an environmental um, NGO, so a non-profit organisation, but we're also an independent research organisation as well. So we do work with academics and universities and we apply for grant funding. We conduct active research, but often through the lens of engaging communities and citizen scientists. So this particular talk pertains to a project um, called Tiny Forest, which is a network of living laboratories across the UK planted in a style called the Miyawaki method. So very dense, um, biodiverse, grows super quickly, starting to gain traction across the world as a sort of environmental intervention. Um, we specifically plant them inside cities and areas of um, kind of high economic deprivation and high diversity to try and engage underrepresented communities into the natural world um and then and then yeah we basically try and get people we're interested in you engaging the community for social reasons but also to help them uh, help us collect data because we've got over 200 forests and growing we're going to have another 50 planted over the winter and we can't measure it all on our own so uh, through our citizen scientists and members of the community, um, we basically collect data on how these amazing forests grow. And I'd really like to explore the role of mushrooms and mycelial networks in how tiny forests grow as well. So if you're interested, Divya will give you the information now. <laughs> <laughs> I have copied the link. So that's the link to our website. So you can read a lot more about uh, Tiny Forest over there. And if you are in the UK, uh, if you're joining us from the UK, we have uh, 208 Tiny Forests that we have planted all around. So, you know, you can go to our website, look at our map. If you have a Tiny Forest nearby, please do. Ha uh, like we have really fun citizen science surveys that can be conducted. So, you know, you can help measure trees to uh, figure out how much carbon they are storing. You can uh, do our biodiversity surveys, you know, found butterflies and bugs and ground dwellers. They're like really amazing ways of, you know, connecting with your local wildlife and also a good way to engage children. So if you're like, if you have your own or you have a school close by or you want to engage your local group of children, that's another way of doing it. Um, and... Uh, have also popped in uh, our email ID. So if you want to get this and get in touch with us uh, with anything related to the tiny forest, you, or if you have more questions for Sophie, so you can always pop that in and I can kind of send it across to the right people and make those connections. We've got lots of, yeah, for those people with children who are one looking for things to do or home educated, for example, we've got lots of uh, not just Tiny Forest, but Earthwatch, who, which is our organisation, Tiny Forest is the project within Earthwatch. There's lots of education resources on our website as well. So if you sort of are looking for things to do or you're a teacher there's some just fantastic resources um, we also we've just finished our science season during the summer so I me and Divya are going out in the field and helping teach people how to do science on their tiny forest um, it's all very easy you can teach yourself everything's online so if you're interested we still continue to measure carbon storage and um, other things over winter but we're also going to be planting a lot more forest soon so yeah. you know if you want to have a yeah there will be up online but every winter which we plant tiny forests and um, which is open to the communities so if there's one being planted by you please come and join and help us put 600 trees in the ground yeah i mean so all, again all our events will be on event right so you know you have already found us here so if you can just follow us, you can find the list of all the events that are coming up. Uh, and as Sophie mentioned, I think we'll be planting close to 50 kind of forests uh, this season. So, yeah, so a lot more to be planted. And if you're around London, I think we have a, quite a big bunch going in there and near Newcastle and Swindon. So lots of tiny forests spread all around. But yeah, keep an eye out. Uh, these are really fun days. To kind of get muddy and yeah plant trees yeah. i see if there's one near you so they're countrywide so we now have like Divya said currently 208 which will be going up to over uh over 250 during the winter we have them all across the uk scotland wales 
now some in the northern in northern ireland we're starting to go international so there's some in the netherlands there's some in australia there's some in japan so um yeah please have a look and if anybody wants to know or understand more about it um because i see there's a consultancy present um please let us know yeah absolutely um any other questions uh, all right uh, feel free to unmute yourself or put some in your chat but otherwise i'm glad that hope hope you all learned something about fungi and how amazing they are um and encourage you to get out and look for them because honestly once you start noticing them it's just just incredible they're everywhere yay okay so just before i close the session and try to pull out the youtube link that i spoke about so um yeah for the ones who who asked for the recording uh i'll be uploading it here uh but yeah you would also have a lot of other recordings that are kind of forest related and all the citizen science surveys so the trainings around them and also uh, there are a lot of videos around the results of these surveys so we have discussed about that Ooh. You and your dog have it. Oh, nice. Yay. Yay. Lovely. Oh, yeah. I've never <laughs> found any. I've like I've never seen any, but apparently oh. it's amazing. Oh, I've always found them, but then, yeah, are you, I, I don't know. They're more like those shelf mushrooms, aren't they? But yeah, in... mushrooms, yeah. <laughs> Yay. Nice. Oh, thank you so much for sharing your stories. Once in around five years of searching, wow. Wow. <laughs> well done. <laughs> That's for you can you can you can actually like if you're really into it you can actually get a no inoculate trees and things like that with with um if you've got them in the garden you can inoculate trees and grow kind of get your own going so yeah. I actually yeah. went to a mushroom growing class it was a very quick starter kind of class so uh yeah she was talk uh, talking about how to grow uh which one of oyster mushrooms at home so using the inoculum and then you know you know you can use substrates like cardboard to start off with and then the grounds yeah exactly yeah. and then <laughs> grow your own and if you have a garden you can kind of have some mulch and kind of transfer it there so you can kind of have your own little yeah mushroom yeah. culture growing and also makes your plants grow healthy so Exactly. Uh, are we ever thinking of adding fungal supplements to our tiny forest soil preparation stage? There has been, yeah, there, there, it's some, some, not us, but Shibendu Sharma, who's sort of the person that um, created a standardised method around Miyawaki forest planting. They they did do some kind of inoculations. We've not mm -hmm. thought about it with tiny forests yet. I w I think we have kind of floated the idea of maybe we could have um uh sorry i'm saying get the certificate from that email what's the do you want to just clarify what you mean around the certification i think certification for attending this uh okay webinar maybe um i think if 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 you if i was if you're relating to the courses that i talked about you can get formal field studies council certification but um but that's through field studies council um i'm not sure if there's confirmation around attending the webinar Divya, yeah, from, yeah but... this is more like a public webinar on uh, just discussion around the fungi not like a certification course as such yeah um, I'll, um... But it, if you have a link to the course that you were talking about, so please. yeah, I'll put them on here because yeah, the Field Studies Council um, they do generic courses, but they also do like formal, uh, like yeah. ecological certification that you can use to work with ecological consultancies and things like that. Um, that's there you go. Brilliant. Okay. Nice. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. So you can find all the links in the chat and hopefully you click them and have it have it saved in your browser for now. Uh, but yeah, please feel free to reach us uh, on the Tiny Forest email, tweet about us, any questions, you can always pop it in and email us about it and we'll definitely get back to you on that. And yeah, thank you so much. Um, here's, here's the link to UK Fungus Day. And um, just while I'm here as well, just in case like the British, mycological society and they've got a link in case anybody's interested 
there's a link on the British Mycological Society for the international symposium that's on Sunday that's free. And if I didn't have plans, I would also be doing that because it looks fantastic. <laughs> so there you go. Lovely. Oh. I'll give a minute for people to click on it so they have that before I close the chat. No worries. Um, yeah, thanks for all for coming. Really appreciated it. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. So let me stop the recording.